neither did I. I went and took a break and got warm after the rainy morning. But this afternoon, I'm going to be sharing this amazing low tide with you and take you for a little bit onto the mud flat to explore some of the creatures here. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about how tides influence animals and the habitats that we see here, as well as out in rocky intertidal places everywhere. Please feel free to share comments, questions at any point in the comments, and I will try my best to answer them um, as they come through. If there's something I can't answer right now, or if I just don't see your comment because I'm a one woman show today, uh, I will try to get to it tomorrow and make sure that you get all the information on tides that you want. Um, if at some point you can't hear me because of the wind, uh, definitely let me know in the comments, say, you know, we're not hearing you very well and I can move to higher ground. Uh, but I didn't want to lose this view, which I'll share with you right now, of our tidal flats out here. So for those of you who were here this morning, this levee, you'll remember, was entirely underwater and now it is, it looks almost like there's no water left. There's simply this main channel out here that goes under the bridge. So there's still water under the bridge. And to the lagoon on the inland side, there is still some water, but most of this area has turned into a mud flat um, and looks entirely different. We are uh, right out, right now we are probably right at where the lowest point in the tide is. So it will increase while we're out here, but only a small bit. Um, it's it was predicted to be somewhere around four o'clock for the Elkhorn Slough and somewhere around a minus 1.2 tide, which since our morning tide was 6.3 feet, that is over seven feet of, di or just over seven feet of difference. So that's a lot of ground to cover. And this morning we talked a little bit in, or more in depth about what causes tides. Um, as a quick recap, our tides are the change in water, which happen all around the world, that are caused by the gravitational pull of the moon on the Earth's water. So the Earth has water all over its surface. That water gets pulled by the gravitational pull of the moon. And as the moon rotates around the Earth, it pulls that water with it, creating high tides where the bulge is and low tides where the bulge is not. Um, and again, we talked about this morning how there can be different tides in different places. So uh, you can have places where you only see one high and one low tide. We are in a spot here in Monterey Bay where we see two high tides and two low tides a day. So this is our lowest low tide of the day, but we will have in the 24 hour cycle another low tide, which will be a little bit uh, not quite as dramatic as this one. When we are looking at intertidal zones, and intertidal zones are these places on the coast that are influenced by tides. They could be sandy beaches, they could be uh, rocky intertidal shores, um, or they could be marshes and mudflats like we have here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. Uh, those tides, that upward and downward movement, changes and influences the habitats and the creatures that you find there. So this is an example of the rocky intertidal zone that you might find in Monterey or Monterey Bay. And there are also, by the way, a ton more birds out here, so we'll see them too. Along the shelf, you have a couple of extremes. You have the subtidal zone that never um, or almost never is unsubmerged. So the things living here don't have to worry about their water going away. You also at the other extreme have the splash zone where these animals that live in this high area almost never see an actual high tide except on king tides really, uh, but they do get splashes of water that help them to survive. And in between, in what we call the tidal range, which is the average high tide and low tide, we get different zones that appear and different animals and organisms and, that become well adapted through time to live in these zones. Um, and creatures that live up higher, especially out in that rocky 
shoreline area, they have to deal with the fact that they might dry out or there might be um, no oxygen coming in if you breathe through the water that can be a problem when it goes away and so a lot of these organisms are things like barnacles and gastropods which is a fancy word for snails um, who have really hard shells they're able to hunker down um, they can often trap water in those uh, little shells and casings that they have and ride out the hot part of the day and the dry part of the day before the water comes back the organisms that live down lower do not have to worry as much about drying out, but they also have to compete a lot more because again, this lower area, if you're an organism that breathes in the water, that's where you want to be. And so there's going to be an increased amount of predators and an increased amount of competition. So all of this means that over time, many of the intertidal creatures have adapted to have really special niches, really special places that they live in um, because they are well adapted to be in just that one spot, in just that one niche. Um, and you can often look at a tidal shelf and identify just based off the organisms that live there where these different tidal zones are. So you can often look at a, a tidal shelf and if you see mussels you know that that is probably where the mid-tide zone is. If you see barnacles you know, especially if there's just barnacles, that that's probably up in the high tide zone. And today we are at or just a little bit below the average low tide line out here. So you can see that pretty much everything's exposed. Now we don't have rocky intertidal habitat here in the slough. We do have some man-made rocky intertidal habitat if you go out to the mouth of the slough, which in the distance here on this foggy day, it's right about here, off of Highway 1, where the harbor is. Uh, there are jetties and there are piers and docks, which do serve as habitat, an intertidal habitat for these organisms. And if you ever go kayaking, out in the Moss Landing Harbor. You can go under the Highway 1 bridge and you will see the same tidal zonation as you have in a rocky inner tidal zone along the piers that are underneath there. Um, but most of our habitat here is a different kind of zonation that looks a little bit more like this, where the main sediment is soft, muddy substrate and here I've used or introduced a new term, uh, mean higher high water, mean high water, and mean lower low water. And this is mean not being like a judgment, um, mean being the average. So scientists look at not just one day's tide because the tide changes all the time. Um, so they look at over a period of usually about 19 years is what I read. They look at what are all of the highest of the high tides, what are all of the high tides, what are all of the lowest of the low tides, and as well, not written in here, all of the average low tides. Because again, we have two highs and two lows in our spot. And they take the average of those. And that gives you an idea of like, on average, what is going to be the lowest point, what is going to be the highest point. And a lot of times our organisms uh, live based off those zones and are adapted to live based off those zones. So out here, if you go from the grasslands, which are off of this chart back here, at the mean higher high water, so this is the average highest point that the water goes, you have the start of our salt marsh habitat, which if you look out here, are these kind of floating islands out here. And that's, they're floating because they're actually built rather than natural, and I can talk about that a little bit at the end here. As you reach down lower in the water and you get to this place where you're at mean high water and you're starting to use more, you're starting to get inundated, that's when you start to see the marsh disappear and the mud flat show up. And the mud flat is where you're gonna have clams, you're gonna have worms, things growing in the water there. And below that in the subtidal zone, you have this eelgrass habitat, which does not necessarily want to be deep down. It does have a point where it cannot grow anymore because it's not getting enough sunlight. It is a plant and it needs sunlight. 
but it doesn't want to be exposed out here. So we can tell by looking out here, there isn't really eelgrass this far back into the channels, but it would want to be out in this water here where it's not getting exposed most of the time. And then this area would be our mud flat, which is what you can tell makes up the predominant amount of the space here. And then in the distance there is our salt marsh. And this zonation, just like in the rocky intertidal, changes the organisms that can live here and how they adapt and how they uh, build their lives out here. So what we are going to do is I'm going to take you all off the tripod. We're actually going to go down onto this tidal mud flat that you can see out here. Um, what I will say is if you ever come to visit the Elkhorn Slough, even if it's a really low tide, don't go down into the mud and you'll notice today that I don't go out very far at all because this mud is very, very sticky and we don't want any of you getting stuck in it. In fact, we have staff who regularly come out to do surveys or to install things out here and even they get stuck. So don't come out into the mud don't get yourself stuck. Um, one of the things that you'll, I'm not sure if you all can see it through the camera. I don't want to scare them too much, especially since I scared them all off this morning. But you can hear the peeps of hundreds of little sanderlings out in the mud flats here. And all of this green is sea lettuce that's been tossed up with the tide. And all of this orange is actually a living organism. It's a sponge. It is an invasive sponge, but it creates habitat that small things may live in or take advantage of. And if we come down here, get it focused, you all can see even in this mud flat, there's a certain level of zonation. So there's an area that's kind of bare where most of the things living up here are crabs. Um, and I'll turn over a rock in a minute so we can see if we can find any. And then there's sponge, which needs to be more submerged. Um, and in between the sponge and these kind of bare areas up here, there are these little patches of brown, which are actually another living organism called a bryozoan, which is a colonial animal. So each of these little funky looking strands has hundreds of animals, teeny tiny ones living within it. So again, you have this zonation. You have species and organisms separating themselves out to try to find their perfect spot within this system. Come down nice and carefully. One of the cool things that I did find when I was snooping around before this was there's a tunicate down here. So this bright orange that's in between the sponge over here, which is kind of a yellow color. And this sponge over here, which is a purple kind, so it's a different species. This is an entirely different uh, taxonomy. This is a tunicket. And what I love about tunicates are they, they look like blobs. They don't look like animals, um, but they are. They eat things. They're usually siphoning plankton that are the little drifting organisms out of the water around them. And they are our closest invertebrate relative. So they are an invertebrate. They don't have a backbone like we do, like cats do, like fish do. Um, but they do have what's called a notochord, which they have for a brief moment, and which ultimately, in a human being, grows into, and in other vertebrates as well, grows into the spine. So this blob... You are more related to this blob than you are to an octopus or sea star or any of the other invertebrates, which I think is very cool to think about. Um, I'm going to take you over. We're actually under the bridge right now. Hopefully the service stays. On this rock, I did find a couple of barnacles. And again, they're hanging out. They've got this wonderful shell that they use to shellac themselves on and they build up. And they're actually crustaceans, so they are more related to something like a shrimp or a crab than they are to uh, the 
snails that we think of as having shells more often. And again, they are really well adapted for being at high tide. They can hunker down in this kind of like bunker that they've built for themselves. They can actually close a little trap door on top of them and seal themselves inside until the water comes back and they can feed and breathe again. So they are super adapted to do that. And I'm gonna see if there are any crabs under here. <gasps> There's one of them. So we have uh, several crabs that live out in the slough. The common one to find up high, like this one, is the green line shore crab. They are specialized to live up high. They're very defensive too. They move very quickly um, as soon as there's movement, probably because they have to contend with a lot of the birds that are often eat eating them out here in the rocky area up high. The other kind of crab, and I'm gonna gently put this back. The other kind of crab that we have out here, I have not seen yet, probably because it likes to live much further down in the water here, and that's the yellow shore crab. And they prefer to be out in the deeper parts of the mud flat where they're more protected. Um, I'm not actually sure whether they're, how they separate themselves out, but it's most likely a competition behavior where one crab species is pushing the other crab species up onto the more dangerous areas because it's stronger or it's just better at competing for food in that area. Um, so again, an example of these creatures pushing themselves out into different niches, niches to try to survive out here. And again, we've heard tons of birds. There are hundreds of sandpipers that I can see out here. And those sandpipers are probably feeding on the little tiny organisms called amphipods that look like little shrimp. I'll see if there's any hanging out in some of the sponge here. And these things like to, they're kind of like plankton in that they, they do drift around in the water. They can't swim against a tide, but they tend to associate themselves with the bottom, with the benthic area. So they attach or they hold on to things like sponges, things like the drifting seaweed here, and that makes it so that they don't have to drift in the water like a sponge. And I'm not necessarily finding any today, which definitely happens. Um, but those little creatures that are going to be living especially out, and they've probably followed the water out, that's what all of our little birds here are going to be feeding on. Awesome. Well, I'd say I'll walk around and show you a couple of other spaces. If you have any questions about low tide or how tides work or some of the creatures that we see out here, go ahead and feel free to drop a line into the comment section and I will try to answer it as best I can. And I still am absolutely awestruck by just how different this area looks at low tide. It reminds me that this place day to day, even within a day, can change so much. So if you are somebody who thinks that you've been out here, who thinks that you have seen it all um, and you've only come once, I invite you to come back again because you absolutely cannot see everything this place has in just one day. You can also see across the way here, this is that tea boardwalk from this morning, which again is now, was submerged all the way up to the line so you could walk down it, but the water came up right to the edge here and now it is completely free. <laughs> Somebody asked how hard was it to walk in the tidal area? Well, I was walking um, up high here where there is gravel substrate that um, makes it much easier to walk. As soon as you move into this area that is just sediment, that does not have rocks in it, it becomes very sticky. In fact, I did try to walk, I think that is my footprint out there. Um, a little before this, I took one step out 
and sunk about six inches into the mud. And that's on the relatively uh, higher side. So imagine you get out to here, you get out into the main channel here, and the sediment just becomes so loose and so sticky that you can, you can easily lose a boot. And oftentimes when people get stuck in the mud, the only way to get out of this mud is to army crawl your way out of it, which is not something that I was hoping to do today. So I decided not to go much deeper out there. Awesome. Well, it has been a blast having you all out to see this high and low tide change. Um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up as our wind starts to come in and our weather starts to come back um, and it starts to get dark outside. Um, but again, I invite you to come out and visit us. Um, we have lots of cool, beautiful trails to walk. The king tides will be here tomorrow and the next day as well. So definitely come out. Um, you, again, you can't come out here Monday and Tuesday because we are closed those days. Um, there's another round of king tides in January that you'll be able to come out for here. But there are plenty of places that you can explore around the slough that are open from Kirby Park to Moss Landing State Beach. And there's also just tons of places throughout the coast of California that you can go out and see. Um, remember, if you're going to visit a place that has lots of these low tide creatures, if you can go out at the low tide, all I ask is that just like I did, you're respectful of the organisms, you don't remove anything, and if you move stuff, you do so gently, and you put it back where it was carefully, because we want to keep these creatures alive. And that's it. I did have one question, it looks like, that came in. Somebody asked how the mammals that live around the slough are impacted by these changing tides, um, because they've seen a lot of scat on the trails. I'm actually not sure whether the, the terrestrial mammals are affected by the tides. I know that certainly the um, marine mammals are affected by them. So something like a harbor seal is going to be looking at, to come into the slough at a high tide and make its way up onto something like a mud flat and then rest there until the tide goes out. Um, they can't crawl really easily. They can't jump up onto stuff like a sea lion would. So they really rely on the tide to bring them into the right spot to sit on and rest for the day. Sea otters, often we don't see them at a low tide here like this because it's much harder for them to move around this area. Um, but as a high tide comes in, we will see them follow that high tide into the reserve even and use it to kind of coast in and feed on stuff. Same with the bat rays and the leopard sharks. When we see them, it's often at a mid tide that's coming in or going out and exposing or uncovering things um, and letting the high zone area and the low zone area kind of merge together. Well, thank you all for hanging out with me today. I hope you are nice and cozy and warm, and I wish you a good day. Toodaloo!